This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 28 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, everyone. I am so glad you are here. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, well, it is raining. And in fact, I'm doing this podcast earlier on a Sunday than I normally would. It has been a gorgeous week here on the homestead, particularly yesterday was absolutely, it was almost perfect. Quite honestly, it was just a very gorgeous day. We actually snuck away from the homestead yesterday afternoon for, well, a little bit of a, we'll call it social distancing picnic. (laughs) We uh, went uh, not too far away, probably about a 20 minute drive away and had a picnic along one of our local rivers. And it was just absolutely beautiful. It was good to get out of the house as much as I do love the homestead and I enjoy um, being here and doing the things that we're able to do. I think like just about everybody else, I'm starting to get a little bit of a little bit of cabin fever, (laughs) a little cabin crazy. And uh, so it was nice to get out. We did practice social distancing, um, but uh, we did enjoy a, 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 a very nice time just having a, a great picnic along the banks of one of our beautiful local rivers. So what have we been doing this week on 3B Farm and Homestead? Well, let's jump right on over to Homestead Happenings and I'll let you know. So let's start off with some good news from our homestead this week. Actually, some great news. And that is our latest litter of pigs was born on our farm. We had four girls and three boys. And so that's always exciting. I always enjoy having litters of pigs here on the farm. Uh, I, I love these pigs. I absolutely love the American guinea hogs and especially the little itty bitty bacon bits. They're absolutely cute. So four girls, three boys. Unfortunately, we had one pass away today and that's always, it's always a sad, sad day. But as my buddy Dave says, if you're going to have livestock, eventually you're going to have dead stock. And so that was the harsh reality of it. This morning we tried to revive it. It was still alive when I found it, but I, we just weren't able to do so. So that Unfortunate, we still have six though, and uh, so very excited about that. This week on the homestead, I also spent a lot of time playing around in the garden and with seeds and those kinds of things. I just love this time of year, folks. I love it, getting my fingers in some dirt, just absolutely a lot of fun, and I just find so much enjoyment in it. So I started some more things indoors, some squash, some watermelons, cantaloupe, a few other varieties of melons, summer squash, zucchini, and cucumbers. So a lot of things like that. Now, some of those things are things that you can, in fact, just about all of those things are things that we can actually direct sow here in our growing area. But some of the squash I'm growing, for example, the blue hubbards, I think are about 110 day, if I'm not mistaken. That's really pushing the boundaries as far as what our growing season can handle. And so if I can give them a little bit of a jump start, then I would prefer to do that. But I will go ahead and direct so a few of those things as well outdoors, like the zucchini, the summer squash, um, the cucumbers. A lot of those things will also get direct sown, but I did want to start some indoors as well. I'm also doing something new to me this year, and that is... I am starting flowers. I have never, ever grown flowers, at least from seed before. We have done rose bushes and those kinds of things. But as far as starting seeds for flowers, I have never done that at all. I've started some marigolds, um, some nasturtiums, I think is how they're pronounced. And then this edible flower mix that I got from the little shop of seeds 
And so excited about that. And then I'll also be doing some direct sowing of those flowers as well. But again, I just wanted to get a few things uh, underway here in the grow light system. Speaking of the grow light system, some of my transplants are just starting to outgrow the shelf height and I can't put the lights up any higher. And so what I've done is I've moved a lot of my transplants out of the office area and I've put them in the kitchen where we have a large atrium door that faces south. And so they're getting a good amount of daylight and my wife is a saint for putting up with this. <laughs> but right now my, my grow light system has a handful of trays left in it. The, the, the vast majority of stuff is either in the kitchen or like my brassicas, I've hardened them off and they're now out on the porch getting ready to get planted out in the garden, hopefully this coming week. One of the other things I was going to do this week and I started to do is I started to pot up my tomatoes. Now, if you're new to transplants, the term pot up simply means that you're going to take them from a smaller vessel and you're going to put them into a larger vessel so that they can continue to grow. And I was looking at the ones that are in the larger Haas seed starting tray that I have and they just didn't look as nice as the ones that I started in the soil blocks. Now, if you're new to this podcast, kind of to bring you up to speed, this year I decided to try out Haas's seed starting kits. I actually bought both varieties that they have. They have a smaller one that has 24 cells in it and the, the cells are a little bit larger. And then I bought the one that has 162 or 164 cells um, where the cells are a little bit smaller. And it was in that larger one that I planted tomatoes and I planted peppers. But when I planted those, I also started the exact same varieties in soil blocks so that I could kind of get a feel for how they grow out in, in either method. They have been in very similar, uh, under very similar grow lights. I, I do have a mixture of grow lights here, but very similar grow lights here in my uh, seed starting rack. And I've tried to water them very similarly. Now, a, a bit of a caveat to that. It is much easier for me to see how dried out or how wet a transplant is in a soil block versus in the seed starting tray. I've had a little bit of a more difficult time kind of gauging that. And I think I may have overwatered the ones in the Haas seed starting tray because they've started to get a little bit of a yellow tint on the leaves. And again, I, I just have a feeling that I may have overwatered them. But as I was looking at them this week, I thought, you know, maybe what's happening is I need to pot them up. Maybe they're starting to get a little bit root bound. And the fact of the matter is I'm looking at about another three weeks to four weeks before I can put them outdoors into the garden. And so I started to, I started working with the Amish paste tomatoes and I started pulling them out of the tray and Honestly, I wasn't getting much of the root ball. I was almost tearing them, them out of the tray and leaving probably three quarters of the root ball in the tray. And I went ahead and, and potted up, I think, about six or seven of them. And then I stopped and I said, this just doesn't feel right to me. And I did go watch a video uh, that Travis has put out on his YouTube channel. And it seemed to indicate, he seemed to indicate that if you're not getting the whole of the root ball, then they're not ready to come out of the tray. So I stopped and I said, okay, I'm just going to go forward as is and see how things go. Now, I don't think I lost the ones that I potted up because with tomatoes, if you look on a tomato stem, you're going to see a bunch of hairs on those. And if you plant those deep, those will actually become roots. And so I just went ahead and planted those deep into the next size up. I'm actually using solo cups and it does seem like things uh, are, are okay. They haven't wilted. They haven't died on me yet. So fingers crossed I didn't ruin them. I don't think I have, but I did stop my potting up exper experiment. And so what I've just determined is I'm going to go ahead and roll the dice. I'm going to go all the way from 
putting them in the, the seeds in that soil till transplant time in that seed starting tray. And then we'll see how things go once I put them out into the garden. At the end of the day, the important thing is not so much how they look when I put them out in the garden as much as how they take off and how productive they are after they've been in the garden. And Travis claims that the smaller transplants actually will become acclimated to the soil conditions, the weather conditions, and so forth, and will thrive better than the larger transplant. So we're going to find out and see how things go. I will keep you up to date. I also spent some time in the garden putting mulch between the uh, raised beds. I planted some more things, just a lot of things going on in the garden. I won't bore you with all of the details. I've put a lot of pictures up on our Instagram and Facebook account, so check those out. And that'll just kind of keep you up to date with what we've had going on here on the homestead. It was a very busy, very productive uh, week on the homestead. Very happy with where we're at as far as this time of year. And just hoping that things will warm up a little bit more. It'll become a little bit more consistent weather-wise. It's been a little bit cold. Um, a lot colder end of April than we had end of March. But... Uh, the weather's the weather, whether we like it or not, and so we'll just roll with it. One last thing I did want to share with you, if you again follow our uh, Instagram or Facebook accounts, you will have seen some shenanigans this week, shall we say. And uh, what I did is I was actually just kind of feeling foolish this week, maybe it's just quarantine crazy, and so I shot a, and I'm using huge air quotes here, ad campaign. Um, for Creek Road Pottery, which I'm not sponsored by them. It's my, my brother-in-law actually is the potter at Creek Road Pottery. He's not paying me to say anything here, folks. Um, but I just was feeling silly and thought, oh, I can come up with this great ad campaign. And so it was kind of just this tongue-in-cheek thing that I sent to him and my brothers and some buddies. Um, and we had a laugh about it. He says, oh, this is great. We've got to release this. And uh, so we have released a couple of those pictures this week and there'll be a few more coming out this next week so hopefully it gives you a good laugh it's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing but the, do check out creek road pottery he does make great stuff um we get a lot of things if he's trying things out he'll send it to us for for us to kind of you know give a whirl um but uh again not sponsored by him in any way shape or form uh, but it was just something kind of fun that I did this week. And so it might give you a good laugh. Pop over to Instagram or check us out on Facebook and hopefully you'll get a good chuckle out of it. All right, that's what's been going on on the homestead this week. Let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. Two questions I get asked very frequently with regards to homesteading are how do you find time to homestead and does homesteading actually save you money? And really that goes back to the whole time-tested debate, time versus money, which is more important, which is more valuable. And there are a lot of people who have written a lot on that subject, so I don't want to go too far down that road. But it does take both time and money in order to be able to be successful in a homesteading endeavor. And so today, I thought we would spend some time talking about ways that we can maximize those two resources in order to be as successful as possible on our journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And so today what I want to do is I want to riff off of that environmental slogan that is well known and perhaps worn out, <laughs> reduce, reuse, recycle, and how we can take those ideas and apply them to our homesteads in order to be able to maximize the resources that we have at our disposal. The first thing is reduce. What are some of the things that we can reduce in order to really maximize our homestead's potential? The first thing that comes to my mind is that we may need to consider reductions in spending. 
Now, I know this is something that is a very, very personal topic. Um, and so I'm, I'm walking on eggshells a little bit here because I certainly don't want to come across as pretentious or anything like that. But especially if you're brand new to homesteading, you're not going to be able to continue to spend money the same way you did before you became a homesteader and be successful at it. At least I don't think that's possible. As I've said before, there is a real cost to raising real food. And so if you're going to be successful as a homesteader, I think you're going to have to make adjustments to how you have spent your money in the past versus how you're going to spend your money now, at least if you don't want to go into a whole heck of a lot of debt while doing this. Now, I want to be careful here that I don't throw out a lot about what we do on our homestead because I don't want you to follow the decisions that we've made. I want you to make your own decisions and understand what's important to you. What you value and what you find important may be and probably is at least a little bit different than what I value and what I find important. And so I want to honor that because I don't necessarily think you're wrong and think I'm right or think that I'm wrong and that you're right. It's just that our perspectives on what is important may be a little bit different. But having said that, I do think that you're going to need to take a look at how you spend your money and look for areas where perhaps you can make reductions in spending in order to be able to free up capital to invest in your homesteading goals. Now, just by way of what we've done here within our family, again, not to get into the details, but just at a very high level, we've made some decisions that go against what our culture necessarily says is important. And so you may need to make some decisions with regards to how you spend money that are a bit countercultural that go against societal norms, that your friends might find weird. And you're going to need to be okay with that. But I don't know what those decisions are. You're going to need to sit down as an individual with your wife, your husband, your significant other, your children as a family unit, and make those decisions yourselves. But I do believe that reductions in spending to free up capital to be able to homestead are something that you're going to seriously need to consider. And I certainly don't think these are decisions that you make once and then you're done forever having. These are adjustments that you're continually having to make. You're continually having to reevaluate how you're spending your money, where you're spending your money. In order to understand, do I need to free up a little bit more money to put into my homestead or do I need to slow my roll on the homestead side because there are some other things that I need to focus on? Again, it's trying to find that balance. But certainly, I think that reducing spending is something that all of us need to consider in order to be able to maximize the amount of finances that we have to invest in our homestead in order to be as successful as we'd like to be on our homesteading journey. The second thing I think we need to look at reducing is debt. Again, I know I'm on some very, very thin ice here. <laughs> and this is something that is very, very personal, and I, and I understand that. I am not a financial planner. I'm not a financial guru. I'm not a CPA. So please keep that in mind. But I do think that carrying high loads of debt is a is not a good idea from the stand. Well, I don't think it's a good idea in general, but certainly I can see how carrying a lot of debt can serve as a barrier to success with regards to homesteading. I just simply look at it from the standpoint of every dollar that you spend in servicing debt. So every dollar you spend on an interest payment is a dollar that you've lost from being able to invest into your homestead. Now, sometimes you may have to do that. I mean, we have a mortgage on our house. I get that. But in particular, carrying loads and loads of high interest debt is not really a great way to find success 
on your homestead from the standpoint of having the capital necessary to invest in the things that you're going to need to invest in if you want to find success. So reducing debt is something I think that's very, very important. And again, I'm not a CPA, a financial planner, anybody like that. But I would highly recommend you check out, if, you, if you're not familiar with Dave Ramsey, I would recommend you check him out. I read his book, The Total, Total Money Makeover. Very, very good book. I've had friends and family members that have gone through his Financial Peace University program, and they've paid down incredible amounts of debt, and that has freed them up to be able to do other things. But another thing that I think it's very important to keep in mind, especially at this time when a lot of people are coming into homesteading, maybe having been laid off or had their hours cut back, and so maybe they have more time to invest in homesteading and maybe less money, the temptation is going to be there to fund your homesteading endeavors on the credit card. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you don't do that. If that means that it takes you longer to get to where you want to go, but you're paying as you go, I think that's a much better option. So not only is it reducing the debt that you have, But reducing the accumulation of debt, I think, is very important if you're going to be successful on your journey toward self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. The first two things that we've talked about reducing have everything to do with money. Now let's talk about some of the things that we might want to think about reducing as it relates to time. So just like you can't, in my opinion, again, this is just my opinion, But just like you can't continue to spend money the same way you did before you became a homesteader, I don't believe you can continue to spend time the same way you did before you became a homesteader. And so that means I think that you're going to need to make some very difficult decisions with regards to the activities that you're involved in or the activities that your kids are involved in. You may need to take a step back from some things, some good things. But if you're going to have the time necessary to put into building out a homestead, again, there's only 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. And so how you choose to spend that time is going to directly impact the amount of time you have to invest in your homestead. And at the end of the day, it takes time to be a homesteader. If you have animals, you're going to need to feed and water and care for them, and that takes time. If you're going to plant a garden, that takes time. If you're going to harvest that garden, it takes time. If you're going to preserve that harvest, it takes time. And so, again, you need to find that balance of the things that you think it's important to be involved in off the homestead versus your homesteading endeavors. And folks, I'm talking to me just as much as I'm talking to you. I've shared with you before that I lead a very, very busy life, and I don't say that to be braggadocious at all. I say that to say that there are some tough decisions that I need to make with regards to some of the things that I'm involved in. But I also know that there have been some very difficult decisions that we've made as a family about things that we have decided not to get involved in so that we do have time available for us to be able to raise and grow our own food, and those kinds of things. So reduce the number of activities we're involved in or that our kids are involved in. Now, sometimes that may mean not necessarily quitting something. It may mean outsourcing something. So, for example, you know, you may decide, hey, I don't want to cut the lawn every week. I'd rather pay the neighbor kid, you know, 20 bucks a week or whatever it is to cut my lawn. So there are some times when you can outsource some things in order to free up that time, but just keep in mind that every dollar that you spend in outsourcing something is a dollar that you don't have to spend on your homestead. And so again, it's just that balance that we're trying to find, but reducing the number of activities we're involved in can help us free up time so that we have time to invest in our homesteading endeavors. Another thing that we're probably going to need to think about reducing is the amount of time we spend on social media and on digital entertainment. And this, again, I know is a very, very touchy subject. 
but I don't have to tell you that Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and the list could go on on and on and on and on and on. They can be huge time drags. It's very easy to get caught up in the drama on Facebook. Ask me how I know. <laughs> it's easy to get lost in the pretty pictures on Instagram. It's easy to spend hours watching YouTube content. It's easy to spend the weekend binge watching, you know, your favorite show on Netflix or or whatever. And folks, I'm I'm not necessarily saying any of those things are bad, except maybe getting caught up in the drama on Facebook. <laughs> but the point is, is that the more time we spend in those areas is less time that we can spend advancing our goals of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Now, the Facebook homesteading groups, for example, they can be a great source of information and inspiration, but they can also be a place of drama and discouragement. Instagram and YouTube can be great places to feel inspired, but they can also be a great place to feel inferior. And while every once in a while a little Netflix and chill is probably just what the doctor ordered, it can also get in the way of spending time in the garden or spending time in the chicken coop or spending time in the kitchen or spending time with your kids and the list goes on and on and on. And so I really do think that if we're going to be serious about raising and growing our own food, if we're going to be serious about our homesteading journey, it probably is going to require at least us to think about reducing some of the time that we spend on social media and digital entertainment. Another thing that I think we need to reduce is our expectations. What do I mean by that? Well, I think it doesn't matter whether you have been homesteading for a long time or you are brand new to homesteading. The temptation is there to try to do too many things too quickly. We want to raise all the things. We want to grow all the things. We want to do all the things. We want to learn all the things. We want to preserve all the things. And I mean, those are all admirable goals. But if we try to do it all at once, we are going to overwhelm ourselves from both a time and money perspective. And so I think it's just really important for us to take a step back and to reduce our expectations. We're not going to be able to achieve self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability overnight. Again, this is a journey. That's why this is called the Homestead Journey Podcast. And all of us, myself included, we need to be reminded of that. We don't need to do all of the things all at once. In fact, if we try to do all of the things all at once, that's a really, really bad idea. That's a recipe for disaster, not a recipe for success. And so we need to reduce our expectations and give ourselves a little bit of grace and understand that we just need to be taking the next step, the next step, the next step. Sometimes it's a baby step and that's okay. But we don't need to do all of the things all at once. Bad, bad idea. So please, please, please avoid the temptation <laughs> of trying to do too many things all at once. And folks, it's a very easy thing for me to say, but it is something I think any, whether you're brand new or you've been doing this for a long time, you're going to find yourself making that mistake again and again and again. And so I think we all, every once in a while, need to be reminded that we need to resist the temptation to do too many things all at once. Another way that we can reduce our expectations is by reducing the temptation to keep up with the Joneses. And I see this happen very, very, very often. People look at somebody and they say, well, I need to do exactly what they're doing. Now, on one hand, I get that because there are a lot of people who are coming into homesteading who have no role models from the standpoint of a grandparent or a parent or an aunt or an uncle who have done this. And so they are looking at certain individuals and they're saying, well, that is the model that I need to follow. And I'm not necessarily saying that is wrong. 
except that you need to keep in mind that those people may have been doing this for years and maybe even decades. And so, yes, you may someday get to where they're at, but it's not going to be tomorrow, and that's okay. I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm saying that to encourage you, right? You don't need to keep up with the Joneses because you're not with the Joneses. You're not the Joneses. I'm not the Joneses, right? So you need to be focused on your journey. And yes, for you to look and draw inspiration from other people is great. And I I think it's awesome. I, I mean, all of us, I think, should be doing that. But on the other hand, we also need to understand that we're not there yet, and that's okay. If we try to keep up with them, we're going to, again, put ourselves in a position where financially or from a time perspective, we may feel overwhelmed. One of the other things I think sometimes people forget is when you are looking at some of those influencers, they may not have paid for the products that they're using. And I don't say that to be negative. I'm just simply saying that Just because so-and-so has a brand new side-by-side doesn't mean that they went out and bought a brand new side-by-side. And so you look at they say, well, I need to get a side-by-side because so-and-so has a side-by-side, but their financial situation is going to be different than your financial situation. And so resist that temptation to keep up with the Joneses because how they acquired that side-by-side may not be how you will acquire that side by side. And you don't necessarily, again, going back into the idea of assuming lots and lots of debt to fund your homesteading goals and dreams and ambitions, you may not even be going down the same path that the Joneses are, even though the end result is the same, that you have a side by side now. But again, just keep in mind that their financial situation and the way that they got that side-by-side, just using that as an example, may be different than your financial situation and the way that you're going to acquire that side-by-side. As you're seeking to draw inspiration from other individuals, I think there's some questions you can ask yourself that will help you avoid getting caught up in the temptation to keep up with the Joneses. The first one is simply, does this thing this animal, this activity, does it fit within the goals of my homestead? So for example, one of the things that I see right now is a very, very popular activity within homesteading is a lot of people are getting family milk cows. And that may be a great fit for for them. I hope it is. But I will tell you right now, for us on our homestead, Here on 3B Farm and Homestead, I highly doubt we will ever have a family milk cow. Now, I'm not going to say never, because never is a long time. But right now, I don't see that a family milk cow fits into our goals for our homestead. It's very easy to get caught up in that and think, man, I would love to have raw milk. And I would. And I would love to have homemade cheese. And I would. And I would love to have homemade yogurt from our cow, and I would. But it doesn't fit within the goals of our homestead for two reasons. Number one, I don't think I've got enough land to support a cow. And number two, I right now don't feel like I have the time to support having a family milk cow. So it doesn't fit within the goals of my homestead. Now it may fit within the goals of your homestead, and that's great but it doesn't fit within my goals. The second question that I would ask myself is, do I need it? Whatever the it is, do I need it? Is it something that I might want or is it a need? And again, that's going to vary from person to person. Now, if you say, well, yes, I need it, then the next question might be, do I need it now? You know, there are I've told you before, I I use Google Keep Notes to keep track of a lot of things. And there are things that have been on my list literally for years for our homestead that someday I would like to get. And I feel like in the scheme of my homesteading journey, they are needs, but I don't need them now. That makes sense. So one of the things, for example, that I, I really want to get is I want to get a dehydrator. I feel like, 
to say do I need it? Well, maybe that's a bit of a an overstatement, but I really do think that from a food preservation perspective, adding dehydration as a means of preservation of food would go a long way to helping us maximize our harvest. Do I need it now? No. There's nothing out there in my garden right now that's growing that I would need to be able to dehydrate at this time. Now, if I find a dehydrator at a really good price, then I might go ahead and buy it. But do I need it now? No, I don't need it now. Another question you might want to ask yourself is, can I find something like it for a little better price than the it, whatever it is, is? So can I find it used on Facebook Marketplace, on Craigslist? Or maybe I could find a different model or from a different store um, or a smaller version. I don't, you know, I don't know. But some of those questions are questions I think that you should ask yourself to help reduce your expectations and to reduce that temptation of just getting caught up and keeping up with the Joneses. So reduce our spending, reduce our debt, reduce the number of activities we're involved in, reduce the amount of time we spend on social media or digital entertainment, um, reduce our expectations, give ourselves a little bit of grace, avoid the temptation to do too many things all at once or to try to keep up with the Joneses. I think all of those things are great ideas as far as helping us maximize our financial and time investments into our homesteads. The second thing that we're going to talk about is reuse. Now, certainly we live in a very, very disposable throwaway society. And sometimes, quite frankly, folks, it does make more sense financially to replace something than to repair it. And so you're going to have to make those judgments, you know, on a case by case basis. But even if you're not going to be able to repair something or you choose to buy something new, is there a way that you could reuse or repurpose whatever that thing is? Now, there are a lot of things that we sometimes I think would just kind of in the past have thrown out or tossed away that we may be able to repurpose on our homesteads. I mean, pallets are one that come right to my mind. There's like a thousand and one different ways that you could repurpose pallets on Pinterest. Some of the ways that we have repurposed pallets around here has been the grain bin that I just built, housing for our pigs. I built a herb garden using a pallet. I mean, there's just a lot of different ways that you can reuse pallets. Rocks are something that you're going to find, depending on where you live, but especially if you're doing in-ground gardening, sometimes it feels like what you're doing is growing a garden of rocks, doesn't it? So sometimes the temptation is just to throw those suckers as far as you can into the woods. But sometimes you can gather them and use them to create garden bed or edging along a pathway. So rocks are something else that you can use to your advantage. And it doesn't cost you a dime. Scrap lumber. I mean, almost every project I have has a has some waste. And... Sometimes it's hard for me to understand what piece should I keep and what piece should I discard. But on the other hand, there are a lot of things around here that I have built using scraps left over from other projects. And again, the grain bin being one that I just recently completed. Roofing tin is something else that can be repurposed into other things. I mean, certainly you can use it again as roofing, which I have done a number of times but you can use it as a decorative item or you can even build animal shelters out of it. I have a pig shelter that I built out of old tin. So scrap tin is something else that you can repurpose into other things. Feed bags. Now, if you have the real pretty ones with the pictures on them, uh, some people will turn those into uh, reusable grocery bags. I happen to get the ones that are those white ones or just plain. And so what I do with them is I use them as weed barrier. I've used them as garbage bags. Um, there's just a lot of things that you can do with those feed bags. Baling twine is something else. I mean, baling twine is kind of like the duct tape of the homestead. I've used it uh, to mark the grids for my square foot garden. 
Um, I use it to tie sometimes together the hog panels when I'm needing a different configuration. So again, bailing twine is something else that you can repurpose into other things. Sometimes we need to think about things that other people are getting rid of that we might be able to either repurpose or reuse. Obviously, the 55-gallon drums, the blue ones, you know, you can turn those into animal waterers. You can turn those into rain catchment systems. You can turn those into raised beds. You can turn those into feed troughs. I mean, there's just so many things that you can do with those 55-gallon drums. The bigger white IBC totes or something else that can be used for maple sap collection, for water catchment. I've seen people turn them into animal housing. People use them to carry firewood. So again, a lot of things that those IBC totes can be repurposed into or reused. Old windows. Sometimes you can find those on Facebook or on Craigslist. And you can use those to make greenhouses and cold frames. Used appliances. You know, you may want to put in an outdoor kitchen. And so you might be able to find a stove on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace that you could use in your outdoor kitchen. Um, buckets are something else. I've told you about that before, where you can get those at your deli or local bakery. Sometimes you can find old pressure canners and sometimes new pressure canners that people are getting rid of in jars. So a lot of things like that that you can find used but are very, very serviceable and things that you can then reuse on your homestead and save yourself quite a few bucks. I mean, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, those are your friends. So not only reduce and reuse, but recycle. And what do I mean by recycle in the context of our homesteads? Well, can we take an output from one process and use it as an input to another? So for example, like spoiled or dirty eggs, I give them to my pigs. The lysine is great for the pigs and we're turning eggs into bacon. Rotten produce or produce that's past its prime, give it to your pigs, give it to your chickens, maybe well, not the rabbits. Rabbits have a little bit more of a sensitive digestive system. Weeds. Instead of just complaining about them, pull them. Give them to your pigs. Give them to your chickens. Give them to your rabbits. The manure from your animals goes into your compost or maybe even goes right into your garden, depending on what it is. Spoiled hay. Instead of pitching it over the bank, use it as mulch or put it on your compost pile. Grass clippings, again, you, I've told you before, I hate to mow the lawn. But now that I think about it, I'm like, well, I'm going to grab these grass clippings. I'm going to use a bagger, and then I'm going to take those grass clippings, and I'm either going to use them as mulch, or I'm going to use them as compost, or I might even throw them to my animals to let them root around in it. So now, instead of me looking at it from the standpoint of I'm wasting time, I'm now gathering resources. <laughs> whatever it takes folks whatever it takes right leaves are the same way i hate raking leaves and hate doing cleanup i did that with my son this weekend but not only was it a good time to spend with him but we can take those leaves and either use them as mulch or we can use them as compost or we can use them as deep bedding i dump them in the chicken run and let them scratch through it and they're going to break it down and turn it into compost wood chips Again, something else that a lot of people will just get rid of, although because of the back to Eden thing, it's become a little harder to source wood chips, but use it as mulch, use it as compost, use it as deep bedding. And then of course, the compost that we're generating, we can put it into our gardens and into our flower beds. And we're recycling all of this stuff that otherwise we might've just thrown away, but we're turning it into something usable. And you may be able to do that with things from off your homestead. Maybe you can find spent grain through a brewery or whey through a cheese house, or you might be able to find vegetables through a farmer's market or through a food bank or through a, a grocery store that you can feed your animals. But find ways that you can take a output from one process where it might be discarded and thrown away and you can take it and use it as, as an input to another process to create value. And every time you do that, folks, 
You're stretching those homestead dollars a little bit, a little bit further. Maybe you're taking your the time and you're stretching that a little bit further because you're generating compost on your property. So you're not having to go pick it up at the garden center and bring it home. So you're saving both time and money, but whatever you can do to find ways to take an output from one process and use it as an input to another, I think you're going to reap benefits in both a time and a financial perspective. So folks, hopefully you found this helpful. Reduce, reuse, recycle. It's not just about the environment. It's about your homestead and Guess what? If you do those things, you're actually helping the environment and you're helping your pocketbook and you're helping yourself find a little extra time to put into this homesteading journey. I hope you found this helpful, folks. If you have, let me know. I would love to hear from you. Brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. You can check us out on our brand new website, thehomesteadjourney.net. Also, we're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. If you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you jump on over to your favorite podcast player and leave us a review, a thumbs up. And if there's something that you would love to hear me talk about in the future, a topic you would love to hear me cover, drop me an email, contact us on our social media sites. I would be glad to answer whatever question it is that you have or cover whatever topic it is that you would love to hear covered. As always, the music on this episode was provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.